Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much to the organizers. I'm very happy to be here um, in um, a, a different time zone from where I was uh, a couple of days ago. Um, um, can everybody hear me and understand me? Okay, I will proceed. So this, um, this is a two-part talk, as you can see from the, from the title. Um, first, I will tell, um, I, and I won't say anything about identity, digital or, or otherwise, until uh, much later in, in the talk. I'm telling you, you've heard uh, more than one reference already to blockchain and its part in digital transformations. I'm going to I'm going to tell the origin story of the blockchain. Uh, this story will include a five minute explanation, suitable for a completely non expert audience, that actually explains how what's known as the blockchain works without condescending and without lying, but not without a little bit of simplification. And so the second part of the talk uh, includes some warning about um, simplification, including some, um, some very serious warnings that you never, that I'll bet nobody here has heard any speaker say, unless you actually know me personally or you're a professional cryptographer. So, let's get started. Ah, uh, so here's what, I, here's what I just said. The origin story and my warning. The, uh, the origin story is in fact a version of a TED talk, TEDx talk that I gave uh, a little while ago. Um, and I'll start that right now. So my title here is Blockchain Decentralization is Central. So everybody here, of course, has heard of um, Bitcoin. And maybe there's one or two people in the audience who um, have heard of Bitcoin but aren't quite sure what part blockchain has in that big story. So I'll tell you that story. And the reason you can believe me is that, in fact, I'm at the center of the story. Along with a uh, professional colleague, the two of us invented what's now called, called the blockchain. So let's uh, jump to the beginning of the story. It was 1989, not, um, not 2008 or, or 2009. It was 1989. I was a researcher at Bellcore, Bell Communications Research, then the new Bell Labs of the um, tele of the um, uh, um, broken up Ma Bell, broken up uh, parent phone company in the US. I was a cryptographer, a, a young researcher in cryptography, what I like to call the science and engineering of protecting information, keeping it secret if it should be secret, and making sure it doesn't change if, if it shouldn't change. And of course, that last bit is at the center of the story I'm telling. So that fall, a new hire, a new researcher arrived in the lab named Scott Stornetta, and he came to me with a problem that he thought we might solve together. Uh, by the way, Scott Stornetta speaks fluent Japanese, and he hasn't taught me any of it, so, I'm, so I'll, I'll, I won't even try to say anything. The, um, um, he thought we might solve the problem that he phrased as how to timestamp a digital document. And when we did tackle that and came up with a reasonable solution, that was the title of the paper, which you see, which you see on the screen here. We published it the following summer at a conference called Crypto, the main conference in the field of, of cryptography. That was when crypt Crypto meant cryptography, not cryptocurrency. 
And um, here's what we did. So by digital document, we meant any digital file, any, um, any record um, on, your, um, on your computer, these days maybe on your phone, stored in the cloud. We had in mind uh, business records, lab notebook entries, email, photos, video, it could be anything. And as you all know, all such those files are easy to change. Back in 1989, it was clear that all the world's records were moving online. It hadn't happened yet, but it was absolutely clear that that's where things were going. Stornetta and I were seriously worried about how to ensure the integrity and the authenticity of all the world's historical records. Now, available cryptographic techniques at the time pointed towards a straightforward solution, one that amounts to um, trusting a single central entity for the integrity of records, at least within a certain domain. For the technically minded, this, um, uh, this might be called the hash and sign solution. That's an interjection. Um, for, for, for the lay audience, I'll just say, this trusting a single trusted a central entity for the records within a certain domain is like, now I'm using terms from, from the US, but I'm sure there are corresponding, um, co corresponding organizations um, in, in Japan, um, trusting your marriage license to City Hall, trusting your driver's license to the Department of Motor Vehicles, trusting the balance in your bank, in your bank account, to the bank itself. These te techniques work, but translating them to the technical domain was unsatisfactory to Stornetta and me. Because a single trusted entity is what security people call a single point of failure, one that could be tr hacked, corrupted, or bribed. Could we do better? In fact, in fact, we could. So here begins my five-minute explanation of how blockchain actually works. Now, I'll begin with a single technical tool that I'll explain by means of a metaphor. Uh, in, the, um, in the field, the, this single technical tool is known as that of one-way hash functions. So the metaphor I'll use is fingerprinting, physical world fingerprinting. There is, as it were, a way to take the fingerprint of any digital file, of any record. This is a, a good metaphor. The fingerprint of a file is short no matter how, how big the file is. The fingerprint of a file gives no information about the file, just like from my right forefinger fingerprint, you can't tell how tall I am, the color of my hair, or whether I have any hair. The fingerprint is characteristic of the file. If you take several identical copies of the same file, and take their fingerprints, you always get the same fingerprint. And most important of all, the fingerprint is unique to the file. Two different files, even if they differ in only a single bit, have completely different fingerprints. Now, I'll say more in the second half of this talk about these magical seeming properties. But for now, let's, let's, let's assume the process works exactly as I've, um, as I've said in the last few, few, few sentences. Now I'll show you how to use the fingerprinting in order to solve the timestamping problem that Stornetta and I 
set out to solve. Our solution was in fact spun out of Belcor as a commercial entity called Surety to commercialize our timestamping service. So here's how our timestamping service worked using fingerprinting. We received timestamping requests from customers that consisted of the fingerprints of their documents. Requests would come in and we would group them into units. Now, I'll call them blocks. We didn't use the word block in uh, 1990. We group them into blocks. And for each block, we would, as it were, take the fingerprint of the entire block. thereby producing a single fingerprint that can be unforgeably and efficiently linked to each of the requests that are in the block. More requests would come in, we would group them in, into a second block, and once again, using the fingerprinting process, we would link the two blocks together, including the fingerprint of the first in the fingerprint um, that encapsulates all the requests in the second. And so on with a third block, and a fourth, and so on. After a while, we have a chain of blocks. And every so often, we would take, for example, once a week, we would take the week's chain of blocks and boil them down to a single fingerprint that depends, once again, unforgeably and efficiently on every single one of the fingerprints of the, of the week's blocks. And because of how they were computed, every single one of the requests that came in, and because of the chaining, depends on the entire history of, of the blocks. And we wanted to make this weekly single encapsulating fingerprint a widely witnessed, widely witnessable, widely verifiable event. How did we do this in 1995 when the world's community of digital online users was considerably smaller than it is right now? Well, here's what we did. We put that encapsulating, summarizing fingerprint into an advertisement in the national edition of the Sunday New York Times every week. Here's a photo of myself holding a, um, a recent copy of the New York Times. And in an advertisement there at the bottom of the page, you see um, there's a, a digital fingerprint a number, every bit of which depends on every single bit of every request received by Surety, our time stamping service, since it was commercially deployed in 1995. Now, here I have, that, is, that blockchain is still running right now. That, that paper, was, that picture, the picture you see there was taken a couple months ago. Here's the New York Times as I picked it up in New York um, on the way here, literally on the way here at Kennedy Airport. Um, and here's the uh, latest encapsulating fingerprint from the world's first blockchain still running right now. Okay, now the, um, now the story jumps ahead um, some 13 years. It's, uh, we just, um, just a few months ago celebrated with the appearance of this paper, we celebrated the appearance of Bitcoin. As you know, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, she is, they are, um, built a financial system from which fortunes have been made, 
even even um, some people are doing well just in the last few days, uh, if if you're keeping track of this this stuff. Um, this is a financial system that completely does away with the central centralizing role of banks. As in any financial system, Satoshi needed a way to write down the transactions so they can't be changed. So if I send you 17 Bitcoin, a nice sum, if I promise to send you 17 Bitcoin, you shouldn't be able to turn around and uh, claim that that was a promise to send you 170 Bitcoin. And I should not be able to turn around and claim that I only promised to send you 17 thousandths of a, of a Bitcoin cent. Satoshi, in order to establish the integrity of all the transactions in the system, adopted, adopted the, come on, backwards. There we go. Satoshi adopted the blockchain digital algorithm that I just described to you, adopted it directly. Now, I'm not here to say um, more about the uh, wonderful combination of ideas that Satoshi put together in order to launch Bitcoin. But the integrity of the transactions on, on the system using fingerprinting in, um, uh, to link transactions together is done exactly in Bitcoin the way it is in the time stepping system I described to you. Now, financial systems, banking, are not, of course, are of course not the only um, uh, central institutions that we, re re we rely on for records. I'll, here I'm pointing to, um, come on, sorry. So here's a, ID 2020 is one international project to um, use blockchain techniques for digital identity for all the world's uh, people, or anyone who wants one, though um, it's uh, especially directed at the more than one billion people on the planet who cannot rely on national IDs because of political chaos or um, natural disaster, or worst of all, both happening the same, at the same time in the same place. Um, There are all there are uh, blockchain as a um, a way of um, uh, ensuring the integrity of of transactions has been suggested for all sorts of other things. The worldwide um, supply chain of for shipping um, goods from place to place. Uh, there are lots of projects to do this. IBM has a commercial offering to name one large company, but it's not only huge huge shipping containers and huge companies, here's a, a project to, um, to trace the origin of, um, of the, um, the fish you had from dinner all the way from, from its origin. Uh, here's a completely different sort of project that I've, I've spent some time working on lately, using blockchain techniques to um, give cryptographic verifiability to the provenance information for art and other valuable objects. So, um, lo these many years later, since 1989, it's, um, uh, I'm pleased to see how asking a few pointed questions about the integrity of digital information at least has the potential to completely upend all sorts of centers central institutions. So there ends my, uh, my summary, my origin story and summary. And now I'll come back to the um, simplification that I said. This magical fingerprinting process is defined technically with these sentences. So these, uh, these um, the first phrase 
is about um, uh, the first phrase is just a formal definition of what I called a process. And the, um, the three sentences after that are the three magical seeming properties that I, um, that I asserted um, fingerprinting has. So these are, this is a mathematical statement about, about what um, computers, what any digital process can do. Uh, these are, uh, do these functions actually exist? So in fact, we don't know. And here I'll take um, a moment to, um, to talk about the difference between what cryptographers know and what um, scientists and engineers know. We all feel secure in this building even in this beautiful building, even though there are tons of metal and steel above us, we're not worried about those collapsing on us because in fact, we know that the building was constructed using engineering and scientific principles that the experts know to be true. These are facts. And um, um, cryptography though, is built on um, assumptions. We do not know, in fact, that the hash functions that I described have these wonderful properties. In, in crypt um, does anybody here know the name William Goldman? He's a, um, a great American screenwriter, film writer, who is famous for something he said about perhaps the most important question in the movie business, which is, is this story going to turn into a hit movie? As he famously said, nobody knows anything. And I feel that that's true about cryptography. So is um, everything lost? Not necessarily, in fact, at any, uh, the, um, the hash functions that are deployed, um, at least the, the, um, the better ones when better um, implemented, do seem to have the properties I described, but they, they, they uh, deteriorate over time. So every so often one needs to swap in a new fingerprinting process. How do you do that? All right, so here's a, um, Here's a puzzle, a concrete puzzle. Suppose you have a document, you wrote a document um, several years ago, and you timestamped it. You may be using my timestamping service, maybe using some, someone else's, but it, was, it used a particular hash function, H. Now that, suppose now that f hash function is in widespread use now, but a new hash function has been um, standardized and your favorite timestamping service offers you the option of timestamping your doc, timestamping anything you want using a new hash function, H prime. What can you do in order to update or renew the cryptographic security you get from your 10 year old certificate? So uh, writing down the, uh, the question again, C is your 10-year-old timestamp certificate that's proof that your document existed in the world in 2009. It happens to have been computed using a, an old uh, a hash function, a, a standard hash function H that is secure now, but you're worried about um, attacks coming up. This is a very important document. You want to um, make sure this document and its proof of integrity will be good decades from now. What can you do? Well, one thing you might do is just resubmit um, a timestamp request using the new hash function right now. What's wrong with that? There's a um, 
you created this document 10 years ago. You don't, if you, um, if you uh, get a new timestamp now in 2019, you've lost the connection that you, that you wanted for um, of when this document existed in exactly this form as created and registered 10 years ago. Something you might do is timestamp the 10-year-old certificate right now. But even that doesn't work because what you're worried about is a new devastating attack on the old hash function. If what you do is submit a new timestamp certificate right now, a new timestamp request right now for your old certificate, the only link between your document and this suggested renewal process is the fingerprint, the 10-year-old fingerprint using the old hash function of your document. So what should you do? Okay, I've, 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 I've phrased this in terms of leading questions, so by now some of you see where I'm going. What I suggest is instead that you should submit a compound timestamp request consisting of your original document and the old certificate. The point is that the new, you have to use the new um, hash function to touch every bit of the original document. Otherwise, um, otherwise you are completely lost. So that is the solution to the problem phrased merely in terms of timestamping requests. What if you have fielded a, um, a large blockchain, blockchain system that's meant to ensure the integrity of a huge storehouse of the world's documents of, cer of certain sorts? Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain or a blockchain system meant to back up uh, a, um, a well-designed, well-deployed government system for identities and legal documents for an entire nation? This is still an open question. I don't know. But it needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. ありがとうございました。Thank you so much.